สวัสดีครับทุกทุกคนเชิญครับผมเอ่อผมชิวไมค์นะครับแล้วก็วันนี้เราจะพูดเกี่ยวกับเอ่อประเทศไทยแล้วก็ถ้าคุณอยากสอนที่ประเทศไทยผมมี secrets นะครับเยอะ there is no actual way that I could do this whole video in Thai that it's such a beautiful language เอาไรเล็กหมื่นตันปูนหมื่นตันนะมีไหมมี so you should learn it Last year, I did a video about teaching ESL in Hawaii, and the girls liked it. So I thought, why not do one for Thailand? Um, I've only taught in Thailand two years, but I do feel like I have some things to share. So if you're interested, uh, let's talk about it. So this video is for people who are thinking about a career in ESL, have one already, and would like to try traveling abroad, and are looking at Thailand. In this video, I'll talk about your options, the different types of places you could teach, qualifications based on these different places, what you would need to work at each of them, where you can find job postings, like how do you find out who's hiring, and finally, some cautions, warnings, I don't know, suggestions, uh, maybe to make your experience as smooth as it possibly can be, uh, maybe some mistakes to avoid. Okay, where can you teach? I would say there's three to four categories. You've got public school, so like elementary, middle school, high school. You have private schools or international schools, so these are going to cost the students more to go to, but the uh, draw of these schools is that most of the teachers are foreigners, so they get that international experience. You can teach at universities. Every province has two or three, you know, big universities. They have like the Rachapats, which I would kind of equate to like community colleges almost in the United States. But then they also have like the, the I don't know what you call them, like province university or city university. So for example, if I wanted to teach in Chiang Mai, then they have Chiang Mai University. So it's similar to like in the US where we have like Florida State and then we have like the community college down the road. And then there's the tutoring schools or the cram schools. So these are the ones, um, I think there's like some famous ones in Bangkok, like Wall Street English. A lot of them do testing. So it's like a IELTS center or a center that focuses on TOEFL and TOEIC. Or the tutoring schools could just completely cater to children or kids. And so they're just extra supplemental classes after the kids go to public school. So there's a lot of choices, a lot of options to think about, but before you look at all of them, it's good to know what qualifications each one requires. So what if you are a Westerner, but you have no experience teaching English as a second language, you have no qualifications or degrees in teaching English as a second language, where can you teach? Usually elementary schools or the public schools. So if you don't have any experience or credentials in the field, but you do have at least a four-year degree in some field, then you can definitely teach with the youngins. Elementary schools, primary schools, middle schools, they're always looking for uh, foreigners. Um, so you might be doing, you know, like basic, basic, basic English all day, like cat, dog, tree. Um, so just be prepared for that, but you can definitely get in there. But there's plenty of people who I've met or seen that have a four-year degree in um, other fields, but they get a job at like a high school too, and I've even seen it at universities. So you never know, it just really depends on a lot of things. It depends on a lot of things, but the easiest would be like the public schools, elementary schools, things like that, because there is no shortage of schools that want a foreigner and so i mean even if you don't have a lot of experience in esl like it you don't have to have the technical technical knowledge to do some of the lower level um stuff so sometimes people don't have the credentials in esl but they do have some experience let's say i don't have any credentials in esl but i do have a four-year degree in engineering i'm from uh, australia and i taught in colombia for three years okay so that changes things a little bit i've seen it where people actually a lot of people have like a degree in engineering or it or just something totally different but they have taught before so um, they can go all the way up to the university if they do well in the interview 
But most places in Thailand, whether it's an elementary school, whether it's a university, whether it's a cram school, they do want some type of at least certificate in teaching English. So a big one is the CELTA. I talked about this in my Hawaii video as well. But the CELTA is kind of like a baseline for our world, <laughs> the ESL industry. Um, I don't know. I never did one. I did a different TESOL certificate, but I think the CELTA is like 100 or 120 hours or something. Um, so if you are interested in that, it would certainly help you. You can just Google like CELTA near me and try and figure out like where you could go close to you, where you could take a CELTA course. And that would help you tremendously have more options. But what if you have an MA in a TESOL field? Well, that's where it gets really fun. The first time I taught in Thailand, I didn't have any experience, but I had a certificate in TESOL um, and I was young. This past year when I was in Thailand, I had, you know, my MA in TESOL. I had uh, over a decade of experience teaching English as a second language. Uh, trying to find jobs was stressful. <laughs> if you have an MA in TESOL or M MA in Applied Linguistics, I think that's like our sister degree. I just saw a monster. I said, that's my sister. <laughs> Um, then you can definitely really start looking at a, a lot of universities. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Oh, but before I move on to uh, like job postings and where you can find all of these options, um, let me just say one thing about interviewing. If you're going to interview for a job in Thailand, um, whether you're outside of the country or in the country, it's probably going to be an online interview and you're going to have like a whole panel of people like watching you. You can pretty much guarantee that they're going to ask you I feel like right now I'm specifically talking about university, okay? I've applied to five universities in Thailand in my life, <laughs> and they were all the same. Um, I would say the one thing, especially if you're a Westerner, is if you want to um, have an interview at a Thai university, you need to have some type of technological component to your interview. You need to have slides, PowerPoint, a Canva. You need to have something. Last year I was on like the hiring committee for my university so I was observing, um, I mean I guess I was participating in the interviews and I was gagged. Gagged. Gooped. Bitch I'm gaggedy goop to the goopery goop goop goopity goop goop goop. Shocked. The emphasis on having those slides was insane to me like i remember this one particular candidate and he was i thought he was so good he was so friendly i think he was american or something he he was a native speaker he had his little lesson plan ready like he just taught on this little like whiteboard i guess he had experience teaching english and they literally were like um didn't have any slides um, probably wouldn't be able to handle our technology because he didn't have slides. And I was like, what? <laughs> the cultural difference between interviewing for a teaching position in Thailand and interviewing for a teaching position in like the States, for example, is it could not be more different. Okay. Because if you're an American ESL teacher, like, you know that, like, there, you have been in so many classrooms in the U.S. where you don't have any technology. Please, you don't have any kind of, like, drop-down screen. You might have a TV, but in the U.S., like, a lot of times we're just doing stuff with paper, like, paper and pen, okay, whiteboard. That's who runs the world, kids. And I remember in that interview, I was like, did anybody tell him he needed to have slides? Like, was that in the email somewhere? Because if it wasn't, like, how is he supposed to know? When I interviewed for my university position in 2022, I had a zero slides because again, culture, we don't ever, ex we don't ever think about that, okay? I taught with like a whiteboard too. Um, so just be prepared for that. If you wanna teach at university and you make it to the interview, you really do need to have slides. If you want to go that route, you need to have a strong degree, definitely some ESL experience, and you need to kill that interview, okay? The interview is super important. Okay, where to find jobs? So I think the most famous posting uh, website is ajan.com. It's just a big like job forum, and most of their postings are related to uh, public schools, elementary schools, uh, middle, high schools, whatever, but sometimes you can find other stuff. You can find the tutoring, the cram, even a university here and there. 
But I think the key to getting all the options, all the tea, all the story um, is Facebook. Again, another cultural shift difference in Thailand is the importance of Facebook. I don't know how many like business chats I was in on Facebook versus like in the US, we only use email. So uh, if you aren't a big Facebook user <laughs> and you wanna go teach in Thailand, um, you're probably gonna have to change that. So here's a little guide. I would say, um, I'm gonna use the university as an example, but you could do this with like any, if you wanted to like just work in like an elementary school, then you could um, find the elementary school's Facebook page. But here's a step-by-step, -step, okay? If you wanna teach at university, okay, figure out what universities are in the city you wanna go to. So for example, I wanna go to Chiang Mai. So what universities are in Chiang Mai? Oh, okay, Chiang Mai University. Let me go to Facebook. Let me type in Chiang Mai University, find their Facebook page, and then just scroll. Just look for posters that advertise they need a teacher. They need foreigners, they need something. They share everything on Facebook in Southeast Asia, so they're constantly posting like, oh, for the 2023-2024 year, we need, you know, three uh, foreign staff. And on the poster, they'll tell you how much money you can make, they'll tell you what kind of extras they'll give you, whether they provide accommodation. On the poster, they'll give you contact information, um, all that good stuff. So you can just email whatever is on the poster. Or you can message that Facebook because I can guarantee you <laughs> there is some cute little Thai secretary uh, somewhere checking that Facebook every day and they'll see your message and then they can reply pretty quickly. So yeah, if you want to teach in Thailand, you can try Ajahn.com, but honestly, I would just try and narrow down where you want to work, the city you want to work in, figure out what schools they have, whether it's uni or elementary or cram schools, and then just um, attack Facebook. Go hunting on Facebook. Everybody's there. Let's talk about each of these four options. Let's talk about the pros and cons, and I will include money in this section because that's Everybody loves money. <laughs> I'll do the pros and cons, but since I've only taught in a tutoring cram school and I've taught in a university, I don't have a lot to say about, you know, those other ones, the, the public schools or the international schools, but I'll just tell you, I guess, the little bit I do know. Who pays the most? Private schools and tutoring schools. Students have to pay a lot of money to go to these schools, so they're, you know, there's more money to share. Um, but they also have, like, a lot of foreign staff, so I think that's why, like, people pay so much for them. Because it's like, oh, you're surrounded by, like, foreigners, so of course you're gonna learn English. I remember in 2012, like, to take, a, like, a six-week course with me, it was, like, thousands and thousands of bots. So, you know, obviously, if you have a class full of, if you have a class of 12 to 15 students, but each of them just paid, you know, 5,000 baht, ahead then how I, I can't yeah let's do pros for tutoring and cram schools okay these are after public school so um you have mornings free usually because you know the kids are in school it's usually a smaller environment it's like you know maybe your boss and then there's like some you know a few so it's like a very small organization so you get a little more attention if this is your first time abroad it's actually it might be better you might feel a little more comfortable if you do have more attention because then you know you can get through those kind of like uh living abroad troubles easier more easily and you have a lot of freedom in your classes um i remember in 2012 i had pretty much complete freedom i was able to do i mean as long as i was doing like integrated four skills mostly speaking that i could just do the activities I wanted and if you're a new teacher that's actually really great because you can take that time to figure out what works you know what activities are going to be your go-to's what activities you need to work on it's a good refinement period okay cons <coughs> kids <laughs> that's a con for me that might not be a con for you but for me kids is definitely the biggest con i don't teach children uh pass <laughs> Oh, visa, um, working at like the tutoring cram schools also borderline like businesses. So that means when you have to go get your visa stuff, there's a lot of back and forth. They're going to be a lot more critical um, of your paperwork and they're going to be a lot harder 
on you and your school. So yeah, you could potentially have some trouble getting your visa processed as smoothly. Whereas if you go to a university, it's pretty solid. I really enjoyed this past year, just being able to go to immigration and they're like, yeah, he's at the university, like whatever, let him through. But in 2012, I was the first foreigner at the cram school I taught at and that was, it was just like, it was like never ending. And I felt so bad for my boss because well, him and the secretary, they just constantly had to rewrite and re redo and edit things to get my visa. But if you work at cram schools, I mean, they could pay you anywhere from 30,000 baht, which is 1,000 USD per month, up to 60,000, I've heard 70,000, I've heard up to 90,000 baht per year. Okay, let's talk about uni. <clears throat> if you work at a university in the outer provinces, you're looking at like 30,000 baht per month, maybe 35, maybe, 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 maybe 40, but not that much. If you try to work at a university in Bangkok, it's a little different because Bangkok is more expensive. So um, I think they usually start at 35 and then go up from there, maybe around 50,000. So um, <laughs> I was actually supposed to go back to Thailand. I'm was supposed to be there this year, um, but I just didn't go back. And I got two offers when I left. They were both about the same. So I think it was about 37,000 baht plus an $8,000 housing allowance. So if you put that together, it's around 45,000 baht. Um, working in the, working <laughs> in an outer province, um, I made 30,000 baht per month. So it was significantly less, uh, but also life in the outer provinces was also significantly cheaper. So you gotta keep that in mind, um, specifically housing. If you're young and you've never lived abroad, taught abroad, uh, taught English abroad or whatever, then, you know, you might be like me and not care about the difference because, you know, as a Westerner, as come, someone coming from the United States, uh, you do have to kind of mentally prepare yourself. Like, I'm working full time. I'm only making $1,000 USD. But it's different when you're in Thailand, you know, that's a very comfortable amount to make. I was paid 30,000 baht my first year in Thailand. I was 21, I had no experience. I had a little bit of credentials. I had a certificate, that was it. So I actually wasn't prepared for how much it bothered me this time. I got paid the same amount, but I'm 33 now. I have 10 plus years of experience. I have an MA in TESOL. I was, you know, teaching, I was on like four committees, I was editing other professors' manuscripts for publication, like I was doing all of these things, but I was getting paid the same amount I was getting paid as a child. <laughs> That's what it felt like and it kind of built up this resentment over time and so truthfully, I wasn't prepared for that. So if you're somebody who's already kind of, kind of has an established ESL career, like People do it. People definitely do all that work for, for the amount, but I think it's not many. So pros for university, you have a somewhat flexible schedule. You don't actually teach that much. Like um, as a full-time lecturer, I taught like Monday, Tuesday, Friday for a couple hours. That was like my teaching week. And after coming from years of teaching in Hawaii, where I would teach Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 1 p.m., you know, with the same group of students, so four or five hours with the same group of students every single day testing. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, it was super easy. <laughs> At university, there's a lot of sitting, there's a lot of grading, and there's a lot of, like, committee stuff, but I don't think that any of it's hard, if that makes sense. Like, you have a lot of work, but I don't think any of it's hard, so... Um, yeah, I think that pros for the university is that it's a pretty comfortable job. Like it's an office, it felt like an office job and I've never had an office job before. So that was like a different feeling for me. Cons, um, I feel like this is just for me. It's a very formal, like professional atmosphere at the universities in Thailand. I wasn't used to that either. Like any ESL teacher that's taught in different schools in the US knows that our teachers here are very loud, very crass, overshare. <laughs> um, I like that. 
You snort that liquid marijuana. You don't snort it. It is CBD oil, and I rub it on my joints. It's a gateway ointment. Your lungs are dust. Crackhead. Speaking of joints. Um, I missed that, and so I felt like the entire year I was in Thailand this past time. At the university, I was at like 70%. I felt like I was 70% Mike, and then I just really... There was maybe one other teacher that had like a like a Western vibe. There was like one other teacher that I really felt like I could speak freely and talk, um, really talk like myself around. Um, and that was really hard. I, I kind of thought that might happen. So I was prepared for it. Last part of this video, just suggestions. These might not be related to teaching, but um, to enhance your experience, number one, <coughs> learn the language, just do it. Start before you go. In 2012, I remember I started learning the characters, the Thai characters before I left. And I was thinking, I was like, I don't know if this is gonna help me like at all. It did. I'm so glad I did that. When you go to Thailand, just try your best to um, learn beyond the basic stuff because it will really change your experience for the better. If you can speak the language, even like, even a little bit better than the average foreigner, it really does make things so much more fun and people look at you differently and it's easier to travel around by yourself. Number two, now learn from my mistake. I should have known better, but before you go, ask your school how much money you need to prepare for visa fees, work permit fees, any other fees, tax fees, I don't know, any fees. Um, I totally forgot about this. Uh, I think it was because in 2012, I'm pr I am think my school paid for some of my stuff. Um, and this last year I was like traveling before I started my job. So when all the fees started coming in, I was like, oh, I forgot about this. And it was like a lot of money. I think I spent like seven or 8,000 baht um, just on like, like paperwork. And that's like 250, $300 or something like that. So it is a good amount of money. So, you know, just don't forget about that like I did. Okay, housing. Let's talk about housing. Where do I start? I'm kind of bitter about it. Um, <clears throat> if your school or university offers you housing, have a backup plan if you don't like the housing. Have money ready to spend so that you can pay for your own place. And I would say have around 5,000 to 8,000 baht, depending on uh, if you're in Bangkok or not. Go early, look at the housing, and if you don't like it, mentally prepare yourself to, okay, I'm just gonna go look for my own. Thank you so much, but I'll pay for my own. Happy to do that. <clears throat> if I could go back in time, I would absolutely have prepared myself for that. <laughs> Last year, I was livid because I was, I don't know, there was some kind of like miscommunication or the flyer that I read was for like a different, a different set of teachers. And I was under the impression that I was going to get like fully furnished, like at least a mattress. Okay. I just moved my whole life across the ocean. I just sold like 70% of my belongings in Hawaii. I gave up a brand new apartment that I'm still in mourning about. <laughs> I was livid when I got there and I didn't even have a mattress. I had no refrigerator. I had no hot water. I had no mattress. There were termites that were just like obliterating the cabinets. There was mold growing in the cabinets. I was so mad. And people might be like, well, why didn't you say anything? It's like, these people do not know who I am, okay? The people at this university have never met me. They don't know what I'm capable of. They don't know my work. They don't know my work ethic. So I'm not gonna just get here and all of a sudden start being like, I don't like this. And then I saw other teachers come and I quickly realized that it was just a mess. Like the housing was just all a mess. And when I interviewed for my other schools, I was very, 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 very careful when I would ask them about housing. And I even went to one of the universities before I left Thailand because I was planning to go back. Um, and I was like, I want to see the housing. <laughs> I was like, let me see it. So truthfully, the number one reason why I didn't renew my contract at my university was the housing. I, 
I honestly couldn't believe that that happened the way it did because the teacher like right next door to me had like, you know, it was beautiful, like tile floor, air conditioning, fridge, like two mattresses. Like I was like, how does this like happen? But anyways, it doesn't matter. So I would say my advice, if you are offered housing is you need to uh, just prepare that you might not like it. It might not be, it might not work. Any institution in Thailand that offers housing to foreigners needs to realize that that is our probably number one concern is our housing. So if you prepare for the worst, then you are able to deal with the worst. Whereas I was not prepared for that. So I was like, I just lived with it for a year. I didn't have the money to buy like a mattress. You know how expensive those things are? So I slept on this little thing for a year and now my back's all fucked up. And finally, I think this is the final one. This is for my health girlies. Um, in 2012, I was young and beautiful and not very high maintenance, but now I'm in my 30s and, you know, the body is not always right. So I have a lot of supplements and like weird little health issues. I ran out of some of my supplements. I take, it's not here. Um, I take this little B12 supplement every day. I have like something called Gilbert syndrome. It's so random, but it affects my liver. As long as I take this supplement every day, I'm okay. So I didn't have that supplement for like six months in Thailand and my hair fell out and and I just, my body went crazy. I just now started growing back my hair because it was falling out over there. But um, if you have any kind of like health conditions or anything, definitely don't forget to stockpile on the products you need because you might have a hard time finding them over there. Even simple stuff like contact solution, um, they don't have my hydrogen peroxide solution for my contacts in Thailand. So I used Renew all year. That's not a big deal, but just little things like that that um, you might not think about. Just kind of go through your daily items you use and check, ask somebody, I don't know, look it up. And for my gay men out there, Let's talk about testing. <laughs> this one's for the girls. Um, if you're not interested, go ahead and fast forward. But most gay men get, okay, so most of us get tested a lot, right? So in Thailand, it is nearly impossible to get tested um, in the outer provinces. I tried to get tested in Ubon Rashatani. I tried to get tested in the north, but it's hopeless. They have no idea what you want. They have no idea what kind of swabs you're trying to get. And it's just an uphill battle. And the one time I thought I got the test that I wanted, it was, it was completely wrong. So just be prepared. If you are, you know, one of the girls, um, you're gonna need to go to Bangkok. If you wanna get tested regularly, which, you know, I'm a big supporter of, I think that's great. I like to get tested every two months. Um, I would go to Bangkok for that. Just, you know, take a weekend and here are the two places you can get tested. I'm telling you this because it took me a while to kind of smooth out this process in Thailand this last year, but once I did, it was like really easy. You can go to the, you can go to the Red Cross in the Siloam area and they'll give you this little card. I still have mine. And um, they have all the tests you need and they're pretty in inexpensive. Um, they're easy to get to by the MRT or the SkyTrain as well. Other place is Pulse Clinic, and I love Pulse. Oh my gosh, they are super cool. Um, their clinics are kind of also like art um, exhibitions. So um, they all speak English. They cater to, they basically cater to like the LGBTQ foreign community because everybody in there speaks such good English. And it's very sleek, it's very quick. The only thing is Pulse is super expensive. Pulse is about like three times as expensive as what you would pay in the US to get tested and uh, way more than the Red Cross. So you're gonna pay a lot of money, but to be honest, it's kind of worth it. It's also kind of worth it because, you know, that's the only reason they're there is for testing. And so it's really like, you don't have to feel like uncomfortable or anything. You just walk in and they're like, hey, and I'm like, hey girl, I'm just here for the swabs. <laughs> prep. I Prep also is pretty expensive in Thailand. Um, I wasn't on prep for the entire year I was in Thailand. Um, I was on it for like four years before Thailand, but I just decided, I'm like, I can't afford this. So if you want to get prep, 
Also, I think you're gonna have to go to Bangkok and probably Pulse. Okay, I think that's everything. Um, last year after my Hawaii video, a lot of people DM'd me on Instagram with questions. So if you have questions, let me know. Um, you can just uh, DM me there or whatever. Um, I'm happy to help. But Thailand is a great place. I would probably live there if it weren't so far uh, from home. And uh, I highly recommend it, whether you teach there, whether you travel there, um, people are great. So highly recommend. As a teacher, students are amazing.